This is a lesson on critical thinking, reading, and writing, a quick guide to critical modes of thinking and communication. Hi, my name is Chad, and in this lesson I will teach you how to practice and develop critical thinking. At first, critical thinking, reading, and writing sound negative, even destructive, suggesting the act of tearing apart and dismantling arguments, articles, and ideas. However, a critical mode of learning and interaction is actually constructive because it allows us to construct knowledge and communicate ideas without smuggling in harmful biases and misinformation that can stymie our thinking. Though this critical mode does involve evaluation, analysis, and critique, the primary object is constructive, carefully engaging, understanding, and communicating cogent ideas. Thus. Critical thinking, as defined by the Foundation for Critical Thinking, is the art of analyzing and evaluating thinking with a view to improving it. Applied to the practices of reading and writing, this critical mode becomes the art of analyzing the ideas or arguments communicated in various texts and formulating and engaging ideas or arguments in an evaluative way. As the Foundation for Critical Thinking summarizes, critical thinking is, in short, self-directed, self-disciplined, self-monitored, and self-corrective thinking. It requires rigorous standards of excellence and mindful command of their use. It entails effective communication and problem-solving abilities and a commitment to overcoming our native egocentrism and sociocentrism. What is critical thinking? This figure shows Bloom's taxonomy of cognitive processes rising from simplest, the process of remembering, to most complex, the process of creating. Critical thinking involves the four higher order skills, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. While traditional education often emphasizes the lower level abilities, which are foundational to critical thinking. When you write an essay, you are working not just with remembering and understanding, but also with the four higher order abilities which enable you to argue a situated, reasoned claim and solution to a problem. This is one reason why writing is learned incrementally, not just by memorizing a handbook, but by applying information, analyzing text, evaluating what's necessary, and creating a written argument. In an age of crowdsourced information where search engines have replaced critical reference works and unfiltered answers and opinions can be accessed with ease and very little differentiation, the ability to think critically is as crucial as ever. Some of the benefits of critical thinking include how critical thinking enables one to assess various issues, ideas, and arguments based upon clear criteria. Critical thinking enables one to pose incisive questions and identify underlying problems. Critical thinking enables one to be open-minded about ideas while also concentrating one's thoughts on the qualities of those ideas. Critical thinking enables effectual communication that develops conclusions and solutions as natural outcomes of this line of thinking. This page has been reproduced from the Miniature Guide to Critical Thinking Concepts and Tools, 7th edition. As can be seen in the list, there are at least nine standards by which to evaluate the quality of someone's thinking. Clarity, accuracy, precision, relevance, depth, breadth, logic, significance, and fairness. Feel free to pause the video to examine the list of standards as well as some common questions to aid you in your assessment. The important things to take away from a list like this is that asking thoughtful questions is one of the best practices for developing your critical thinking skills, and second, that they are discernible criteria for evaluating thinking. In this way, critical thinking is more than an art that requires a certain knack for thinking. So if critical thinking is hard for you, there is hope. Critical thinking also functions like a science, with certain practices that promote its development. Thought can be said to consist of at least eight elements. These eight elements are the fodder upon which critical thinking subsists. Critical thinking necessitates a careful evaluation of these elements in each instance of thought or communication. To evaluate a reasoner's purpose, including that of your own, pursue questions like, what is the reasoner's purpose? Is it reasonable? To evaluate the question, what is the reasoner's question at issue? Is it demanding an answer on a certain topic or a solution to a certain problem? To evaluate the information, what are the reasoner's sources of information? Are they representative and reliable? Does the information provided match the demands of the question? To evaluate the concepts, what are the reasoner's key concepts? Are they clarified and defined adequately? To evaluate the assumptions, what are the reasoner's underlying assumptions? Does the reasoner identify and account for his or her biases? Are the assumptions supportable? To evaluate the inferences, what are the reasoner's inferences? Does the reasoner clearly explain how he or she arrives at a given conclusion? To evaluate the point of view, what is the reasoner's point of view? 
Does the reasoner recognize the limitations of that perspective, and can he or she engage charitably and judiciously with other points of view? To evaluate the implications, what are the reasoner's implications? Does the reasoner elaborate on the consequences to his or her thought? Now, as you consider these criteria for evaluating reasoning, you must recognize that critical thinking not only requires certain procedures, but also requires certain dispositions or traits. Becoming critical thinkers necessitates that we become certain kinds of people marked by the following essential intellectual traits for critical thinking. Intellectual humility, as opposed to intellectual arrogance. Intellectual courage, as opposed to intellectual cowardice. Intellectual empathy, as opposed to intellectual narrow-mindedness. Intellectual autonomy, as opposed to intellectual conformity. Intellectual integrity, as opposed to intellectual hypocrisy. Intellectual perseverance, as opposed to intellectual laziness. Confidence in reason, as opposed to distrust of reason and evidence. Fair-mindedness, as opposed to intellectual unfairness. Intellectual humility acknowledges one's limitations, proceeds only where the evidence permits, identifies one's biases, and refuses to feign knowledge of or experience with something unknown or unfamiliar. Example, until the early 21st century, all works on British literature employed a periodizing approach. No matter how possible the statement is, no one can presume to make this statement because no one could have read every book on British literature for over a millennia. This sentence exemplifies intellectual arrogance. As these scholars affirm, anthologists in the 19th and 20th centuries narrated British literature through periodizing lenses. Questions. Is this claim verifiable? How do I know this? Is there disagreement? If so, why? Have I overlooked something? Do I possess some experience or perspective that might skew my treatment of this topic? Intellectual courage resolves to address uncomfortable and unpopular subjects and opinions, embraces opportunities to learn from opposing viewpoints, and refuses to uncritically conform to prevailing opinions at large or in the person's in-group. Example. Questions concerning gender identity are so disorienting and controversial that, for the purpose of this study on 21st century identities, gender identification will be treated as a self-directed choice as many of the most prominent scholars maintain. Unless one agrees with the position, do not assume a position to pass unscathed to the next topic or acquiesce to a position you disagree with just because many prominent scholars maintain it. Conceding to the popular opinion, this statement exhibits intellectual cowardice. Despite increasing support for self-identification theories and the backlash against those who oppose these theories, the authors of this study cannot affirm gender self-identification. Therefore, this examination of 21st century identities opens with an examination of gender and its moorings. Questions. Am I just accepting the consensus on the topic while concealing my own misgivings? Am I willing to base my conviction in the evidence and be true to my conviction and the evidence despite their unpopularity? Have I fallen prey to bandwagon appeals? How has my tradition or subgroup blinded me or otherwise distorted my perspective on this topic or issue? Intellectual empathy attempts to understand other perspectives before critiquing them, tries to identify with other perspectives by stepping into their position and experience or tradition, represents other perspectives charitably, and acknowledges one's wrongs. Example, it is inexplicable why some detractors oppose this bill. Regardless of how unfavorable the other perspective is, the detractors likely have a list of reasons for believing as they do. This statement betrays a lack of proper research and a lack of intellectual empathy. This reductive statement exemplifies intellectual narrow-mindedness. Detractors have primarily discredited the bill because of the tax hike that will inevitably follow. They would be right to do so if the influx of taxes were not recouped. However, the tax costs will be recouped doubly by the reduction of interest rates and premiums disarming their objections due to cost. Questions. Have I attempted to understand where they are coming from or why they believe as they do? If not, why not? How might their position or experience produce alternate interpretations or approaches to this topic or issue? Am I being charitable toward opposing perspectives? Have I represented their perspective in a way that they would approve of? Intellectual autonomy examines the evidence and formulates an opinion for oneself refuses to believe second-hand when first-hand research would be more reliable, and follows the dictates of reason and evidence primarily, and not the opinions of others. Example, as John Piper believes, our common translations from the Greek skew the meaning of this verse. Thus, as Piper says, it should actually read, Regardless of how reliable John Piper is as a biblical scholar, one should never base an argument on the opinions of others without first seeking to verify those opinions. 
Greek manuscripts of the Bible can be easily accessed online for personal research and reflection. The writer of this statement lacks autonomy, exemplifying intellectual conformity. As can be verified in several reliable Greek manuscripts and scholarly lexicons, this word should be rendered just as John Piper observes. Questions. Am I depending on the opinions, summaries, or affirmations of others to develop what I think about a given topic or issue? Am I examining the evidence for myself and preferring first-hand knowledge to pre-digested synopses? Do I accept the opinions of certain figures or scholars without question or evaluation? Am I conscious of the ways I tend to embrace ideas without proper evaluation? Am I desensitized to the values and inferences foisted on me by the media or culture? Intellectual integrity determines to go only where the evidence leads, refuses to overlook or hide the complications and consequences in their thinking, and maintains rigorous expectations for what qualifies as substantive proof and evidence. Example, the burden of proof lies on the opposing viewpoint. I do not need to provide evidence for this argument because I know it to be true. No matter how thoroughly convinced one is of his or her perspective, the ethics of persuasion require argumentation from evidence. One cannot expect opponents to do what he or she is unwilling to do. Force their hand by providing rigorous reasons and evidence. Do not settle for intellectual hypocrisy. Smith has called the various perspectives on the issue to present their evidence for all to examine. In this essay, I have provided three logical proofs, countered the opposing viewpoints, and summoned other perspectives to match the evidence I have provided in support of my perspective. Questions. Am I being upfront about the discrepancies, challenges, and necessary consequences of my thinking? Am I expecting others to provide more proof than I am willing to produce myself? Have I maintained rigorous standards of research, confirmation, and source integration? Intellectual perseverance resolves to pursue the conclusions and solutions the evidence demands regardless of their unpopularity or difficulty, refuses to compromise despite the opposition of others, and understands insights may require extended time and effort. Example, because an extended study of this kind would take many more months of research and it is dubious whether this study would produce contrary evidence, it is safe to just accept the majority opinion on this issue. If a majority perspective may be disproven by extending the research, then persevere until you have sufficiently exhausted all viable options. Do not go along with the majority opinion simply because it is easiest or least controversial. These are empty justifications for intellectual laziness. Although the scope of this project limits the research period, an addendum will be added to this publication chronicling the research findings of this extended study. Therefore, the majority opinion remains under scrutiny at this point. Questions. Am I compromising my conclusions or solutions to gain more popularity or acceptance? Am I willing to toil for answers and solutions to the difficult questions and issues even if it means an extended period of reflection? Have I anticipated the opposition? And am I prepared to not only provide a defense for my position, but also face the resulting criticism for my thinking? Confidence in reason concludes that what is supported by good reason and evidence is the proper solution or conclusion, refuses to settle for argumentation rooted solely in the emotions, and affirms that logic and coherence should govern argumentation. Example, the doctrine of universal human sin is an upsetting teaching and should be rejected because it teaches people to feel bad about themselves. How you feel about a subject, like the doctrine of universal human sin, does not matter if reason, evidence, and experience confirms the validity of the teaching. This statement exhibits a distrust of reason and evidence. Although the doctrine of sin would seem to induce a depressing self-assessment, the weight of reason and experience suggests that it is an accurate assessment of the human condition despite its unpalatable tenets. Questions. Am I willing to pursue the thought or action demanded by reason and evidence, even if it does not seem at the time to be in my interest to do so? In what am I basing my argument? Have I founded my argument solely on emotional appeals? Is my thinking governed by logic and coherence? Am I calling others to rational argumentation and persuasion, teaching them to think and communicate according to the dictates of reason? Fair-mindedness treats viewpoints equally, insofar as they are equal according to reason refuses to allow feelings or interests to alter how one interacts with those viewpoints, and denies opportunities to exploit one's advantage to silence or undermine others. Example, of the legitimate perspectives on the issue, all the non-liberal ones, only those originating in the West can truly be considered insightful on this issue because the agency is addressing the needs of the West. 
This statement reveals an uncritical prejudice against certain perspectives for reasons other than logic and evidence, and exhibits definite sociocentrism. A critical thinker would evaluate opposing perspectives regardless of where they originated, and would consider insights from diverse sources. This statement demonstrates intellectual unfairness. Although more liberal perspectives do not share the commitments of the agency, their action plan for remediation offers several helpful insights into the assessment process. Moreover, the practices common in non-Western facilities inform Western practitioners on how best to reverse the deleterious effects of these conditions. Questions. Am I treating other viewpoints fairly? Are my feelings and interests impeding me from giving certain viewpoints an equal hearing? If so, why? Have I used my advantage to suppress the voices of others or to detract from their opinions, not on the basis of reason? Now, if you are still wondering how all this fits together, consider this helpful diagram that maps out the connection between everything we have been discussing. The standards for assessing thinking give us handles and categories for approaching the various elements of reasoning. And as we regularly practice the art and science of evaluating reasoning, we gradually expand our capacity for the intellectual traits and virtues that characterize critical thinkers. Although the road to critical thinking is uphill and requires conscious effort and constant reflection, be encouraged. You can learn to think, read, and write critically with regular practice. Special thanks to the Foundation for Critical Thinking, whose introductory guide contributed much of the base content for this video. I hope you have found this lesson helpful as you seek to practice critical thinking, reading, and writing. For more information, check your writing manuals, visit local writing centers, or consult online writing helps. Or check out more videos at our YouTube channel. And visit Southeastern's Writing Center website where you will find dozens of helpful links and handouts offering writing assistance for a variety of situations and audiences. Thank you.